All righty, hopefully everybody can hear me online. Okay, we're trying out a new format. We're doing things in house as well as in the virtual realm. So hopefully everything is working okay. Um, if not, please let Jennifer know so that way she can tell me to either speak up or reposition my mic or try something a little different. So good afternoon. Thanks so much for joining me today, both in person, my, my mighty small group here, um, as well as those online on Facebook, as well as Zoom, for Thrown to the Wolves of Woolwine's Power, the dismissal of Ida Wright Jones. So before we begin, just a couple of things to note, like many other female justice programs, um, we're going to be discussing topics that may be a little triggering, for some um, might be difficult for others to hear. So if you need to step out or log off, you these programs are available on the museum's YouTube channel. So you can check that out at a later date. Um, also, I do wanna make our time together as conversational as possible. So please, anytime people in, in here with me, if you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand, let me know. Um, also online, if you're on Zoom, if you're on Facebook Live, I will try to be speaking to you guys as much as possible too. So <laughs> let Jennifer know, she's gonna kind of be the voice for you guys in the room today. So go ahead and type away in chat or in the Q and A boxes and she'll ask those questions for you. And I will do my best to remember to repeat those questions. <laughs> so that way everybody gets a chance to hear. Um, so thank you, Jennifer, also for monitoring those boxes and, and taking care of all the online stuff today. Last two things. I'm not a lawyer. I say this with every female justice. I am not a legal historian. Um, my interest in kind of female justice comes from the, the fact that there isn't a lot written on women's history, especially topics like the one that we're delving into today. Um, so I, use, I usually have to kind of piece together these stories. So have I found every reference and every mention of this case? No. <laughs> Most of my uh, information comes from online sources, newspapers. Um, also, I was a little luckier in this case compared to some of the others where the California Court of Appeals actually had some references to different lawsuits that she had brought against newspapers, against the DA's office, and against Woolwine. So some of those court documents still exist. So they've been very helpful in kind of understanding the circumstances of her firing. Um, also, with this particular case, I was super surprised that no one has written this story before. There is no contemporary writings about this, um, especially because this particular case was happening at the exact same time, another female justice case that I presented, um, the mysterious death of Jay Belton Kennedy, when we talked about Arthur Birch and Madeline Woolwine and, or well, not Woolwine, Madeline Obenchain, and Woolwine um, had tried them in five separate trials. He was really going after Madeline in that particular case. And you can also see that on the museum's YouTube channel. But I stumbled across this story because in the newspapers, these articles are appearing side by side. So he's very, what's bulldoggedly, <laughs> maybe I should say, going after Oban Chain in the courtroom while he's also having to kind of fight on this personal front um, because there are many questions about his own morality and what and how he is treating women within his office that are gonna be brought up through Ida's dismissal. So on that note, let's kind of begin with a little overview of the, the cast of characters, the main characters in our case. So first off, Thomas Lee Woolwine. This is the man that Ida Wright Jones claimed wielded all the power in her circumstances that kind of caused her dismissal from her position as a juvenile investigator within the district attorney's office in LA in 1922. 
So who was this guy? I think he is actually one of the more colorful characters um, in 1920s Los Angeles. He tried some very, very infamous cases, uh, not, in, not just the Oban Chain case, but also um, he tries the um, Louis Pete, Louise Pete case, uh, the, the first murder trial she is put up for. Um, she is then later put up for a, a second one, which also might have to be a female justice story. Um, so he, he is handling a lot of different types of cases throughout Los Angeles County in a very tumultuous time period in the 1920s. So Woolwine himself was not from California originally. He was born near Nashville, Tennessee in 1874. He and Ida are actually about the same age. And he comes to Los Angeles in 1899 and he reads law locally and he eventually clerks for two United States district attorneys. Um, he actually doesn't get his own law degrees until a few years after he was actually admitted to the California bar, because you could do that back then. <laughs> you, could you could read law under an attorney, apply to be a lawyer, to, to be able to try cases without officially having a law degree. Um, but he does eventually go back around 1903, 1904 and earn his LLB degree is kind of the precursor to the JD degree. Um, in 1900, he marries this woman, Alma Foy. Now Alma is a sister to another kind of famous LA citizen. Um, her name was Mary Foy. She was a first head librarian of the Los Angeles librarian system. And she was also a very outspoken women's rights advocate. Now, they come from a very kind of prominent, strong-willed family in Los Angeles. So this was a good match for Woolwine because he's looking to kind of also raise his, his reputation within the city. So he begins the opportunity to be able to do this in 1907 when he is made a deputy city attorney. But it's really the following year that he puts himself on the map. He is named at that time the um, city's prosecuting attorney. And by virtue of that position, he's made a deputy DA for LA County. So this gives him the first taste of being in the district attorney's office. And he hits the ground running. Within the first seven months, he only held this position for seven months. That's it. Um, he went after quite a number of individuals. First, he goes after the LA mayor, <laughs> Arthur Harper. He then also goes after the police chief, Edward Kern. And he accuses the entire police commission of protecting vice within the city. As you can see in this particular article, it says, Woolwine goes after the mayor, prosecuting attorney insists upon an answer to his demand for the enforcement of laws against disorderly houses, meaning homes of prostitution. Uh, red light district must soon be closed. Calls upon administration to unfetter police department and permit it to enforce all laws as they are written. Now this is gonna be a common theme for Woolwine enforce the laws as they are written. So not only does he go after the mayor and the chief of police, he also goes after the prominent social clubs in LA where people like Henry Huntington are hanging out. And he says, you know, I noticed that you guys are providing liquor at your lunch buffets. You don't have a saloon license. It's illegal for you to do that. So either you stop doing it or I'm going to bring the power of the city prosecutor's office and I'm going to close you down. And so they tested him. 
and he went to all the clubs, one of which he was actually a member of. <laughs> and he closed them down. Struggling with my mask a little bit. I'm getting so excited. <laughs> But he doesn't stop there. So not only is he going after the politicians, he's going after these major movers and shakers of the city. And then he takes on the district attorney himself, John D. Fredericks, who is his boss at this time in 1908. And he accuses the district attorney of purposefully impeding his investigations. So how do, you, how do you think this all goes for a wool wine? Man who knows how to make friends. <laughs> okay, as, as someone in the room just said, Jim just said, you know, a man who knows how to make friends. Um, he definitely did not make a lot of them. <laughs> he actually, um, the reason he's only in this position for seven months is because he feels he has become, um, he's, he's prevented from doing his due diligence. He feels that there are so many people standing in his way. He doesn't wanna waste taxpayer money. So he's gonna just resign from the position. If he can't uphold the law the way it's written, he doesn't wanna play the game is basically what he's, what he's telling Los Angeles at this time. And I love this editorial cartoon. I'm gonna zoom in for those online too, who might not be able to see things very well. So here at the bottom part of the screen, let me pull that up a little bit. We see wool wine there with charges falling out of his pockets. We see city officials running out of city hall. There's Mayor Harper right there so let me grab that for the online folks so we see mayor harper right here kind of pouncing on them they're all taking their turns we have important witnesses thinking that they should just you know get out of town now i love this we have district attorney fredericks watching from the sidelines saying how much he's enjoying this and then best of all, we have a tourist talking to a city citizen, asking, what is this all about? And the city citizen says, only a city prosecutor who is foolish enough to try and enforce the laws. So Woolwine definitely builds up this reputation. He is going to fight for the letter of the law. And so he decides he is also going to run for district attorney's office, which he does in 1910. And he runs against Fredericks. He runs against his boss. This does not go over too well. <laughs> um, he does not win that particular election but he doesn't stop. If this man is anything, he is persistent. Um, another, another story I'd like to share just to kind of give you guys an idea of the type of person he was is he not once, but twice punched opposing counsel in the face in the courtroom. The first incident was in 1909. Um, while he was a private attorney, so after he has removed himself from being city prosecutor, he is working a, a private case, and the opposing counsel called him a liar in the courtroom. And he sauntered over and punched him in the nose <laughs> because his reputation, he felt, was at stake. The second time this happens is in 1921 a year before Ida Wright Jones is dismissed from her position. That attorney was an attorney by the name of Paul Schneck. And Paul had alluded to the possibility that Woolwine had bribed a witness to testify on the behalf of his, his prosecution case. 
And again, how dare you sully this man's reputation? Again, he hauls off and punches the guy in the nose. Um, so he was not one to take, apparently, disparaging comments of his character lightly. I want you guys to remember that because for me, in this particular situation, I think that's an important thing to note. All right, so in 1910, he tries to run on the good government ticket for the district attorney's office. He doesn't succeed, but in 1914, he runs again and he shares his particular viewpoints with the press on what the role of a good district attorney is. And I wanna share with you what, what he said because I found it pretty, pretty poignant actually. I'm gonna zoom in here. I wanna be district attorney of the County of Los Angeles, not for the office itself, but to use it simply as a means to demonstrate a great principle that I have always had in mind. In fact, it was born with me the principle of even-handed justice. He says this idea is not of the head entirely, but a deep-rooted sentiment in his heart. This is how, how deeply it flows within him. He then goes on to say that a man who occupies this position where the liberties of human beings are involved should be a man capable of laying aside every earthly ambition and every selfish consideration in a lofty desire to serve his fellow man. To use an office of this nature for personal advancement or political capital means nothing less than the crucifixion of justice. And instead of resulting in the equal enforcement of the laws is destructive of government and means anarchy. Humanity should stand upon a common plane before the bar of justice, and no man is entitled to an advantage over another by reason of wealth or lack of it, political influence or lack of it. Doesn't he sound awesome? Like, this is the kind of guy we want in politics. Well... <laughs> Well, we'll see how that goes, see how you feel about him a little bit later. So what do, you, what do you guys think of this statement online? What do you guys think of this statement? Somebody who doesn't believe he's human is gonna head for a ball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jim, that's a good point. Somebody who thinks he might be above it all, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. If you don't follow the letter of the law, it is anarchy. It is chaos. Yeah, good. So yes, it, absolutely. He, someone commented online that, you know, he talks a good game. Definitely, definitely. He's putting, especially at a time in Los Angeles and across the United States, where the progressive movement is really quickly changing things. In the, in the tens and, and teens, everything is quickly changing and they're looking to kind of rectify all of the woes and wrongs done in the Gilded Age. And this is gonna be the rebirth of a new world order in a way, of, of new politics, of new ways of doing things. So it's also during his 1914 campaign when he makes this statement that he meets Ida Wright Jones. This is Ida. I've only been able to find a handful of pictures of her. Um, and all I was able to find even less about her prior to her work in the district attorney's office. So these are just some of the things I was able to piece together about her. Um, mainly I had to call through kind of census reports, voting registers, um, as well as newspaper accounts. She has mentioned in some papers. So according to the 1880 census, which I'll kind of zoom in here. Let me highlight this little section. It might be harder for those in here to read this. Hopefully you guys online. Oh, look at that terrible highlighting job. <laughs> you get the basic idea around this line. <laughs> 
There is Ida mentioned in the 1880 census. Uh, she's living in Indiana um, with her, her family. Her father, Hampton Jones, has already passed away by the time she's six years old. Um, she is one of eight known children to Hampton and uh, Louise or Louisa uh, Jones. And I'm not able to find much about their early life. I do believe that possibly in 1900, she is in Missouri. Um, there she seems to maybe be bordering with a family and she's listed as a trained nurse as an occupation. I don't know, <laughs> it, it's likely, but oftentimes also kind of tracking women can be difficult um, in, in the historical record. Um, she doesn't appear in the 1910 census. Also another reason why I think it might be her in Missouri is that her mother seems to maybe be institutionalized in Missouri as well. Um, so that's why I think possibly it is this family. Um, the next account I could find of her, let me just erase those, that terrible highlighting, is in the 1914 voter register rolls of Los Angeles. They might be thinking, mm, why is she on a voter register roll in 1914? Because California is cool. California passed women's voting rights in, in all elections from local county up through federal election in 1911. So women here had already been voting for a little while prior to it becoming a national uh, or a constitutional amendment in 1920. And so she is listed on that voter roll as a Democrat. Here is her name. A little better highlighting, not by much at this time. She's living at the Hotel Northern. Why I believe this is her is because I find her at this same address in the 1920 census. Um, but instead of here, she's listed as a newspaper ad specialist. In the 1920 census, she's listed as working for the district attorney's office as an investigator. So newspaper ad specialist, what is that? It's a person who apparently specializes in placing newspaper ads. So this is my theory on how Ida and Woolwine meet. He's running on the Democratic ticket now in 1914 for the district attorney's office. He um, needs advertisement placed in local papers for his campaign. So who better than an, a, a newspaper specialist, ad specialist, which Ida is. So the two perhaps worked very closely together. Here are an example of some of his ads that were printed in 1914 in local papers. For even-handed justice, Thomas Lee Woolwine for district attorney. You always know where he stands. His public record commands your support. And again, we have you know, smaller ads, larger ads, the logical man for the place. We have, this is actually like a half page ad with a list of prominent supporters within the city who uh, want, you know, who are supporting his, his bid for the district attorney's office. Um, he, his own accounts about why he deserves the office. And this just goes on and on and on, you know, stating his record, stating what he's able to do for the city. And it works. He wins the office in 1914. Now, one of the first things he does um, as a district attorney, he takes office in January of 1915. And by February, sorry, this is driving me bonkers. <laughs> um, by February, he, along with a friend of his, Judge Charles Monroe, recommends to the Board of Supervisors that he wants to expand the district attorney's office. If we're gonna do good, we need more people. 
And so he suggests to the Board of Supervisors, which they approve, three new offices within the district attorney's office. Some of these offices still exist there today. The first of which is the complaint department, which was meant to hear both sides of a case prior to any legal action being taken just to see if the district, so it's not quite a grand jury trial. It's, it's more whether or not the district attorney's office should pursue a case. Yes. Um, that I have not been able to verify. So that's awesome that you found that piece of information. Hopefully it is the same Jones family. Um, that sometimes is the challenge when you have a very common last name. So yeah, that, that's great. That's, it's, it is possible. Maybe they met earlier. The reason I'm also basing that theory of meeting him in 1914 is because local papers in 1925 also mentioned that she worked on this campaign. So that was kind of my basis for that assumption. Um, the next department that he recommends is the failure to provide department. <laughs> it's a progressive era. Women are starting to divorce. <laughs> um, guys are starting to disappear at high numbers, leaving their families behind. So there are more cases around family law that are coming into the city. And so the failure to provide department acts as the go-between, between those that need to provide support and making sure that support is given to those families or women who have won, who have been adjudicated either spousal or children, child support. And the last department that they recommend is the juvenile department. The district attorney's office knows that society is changing. We now start to see the development of teenagers. You know, as the progressive era comes through and less children are, you know, working for a living, they start to have a little more free time as child labor laws come through. Um, so kids are, are getting into more trouble. And so it was the responsibility of the juvenile department to again, act as a mediary. Is this something that the district attorney's office needs to you know, file suits against? Is this something that can kind of be like an omnibusman, you know, kind of negotiate something between people before it goes on any kind of permanent record? And so this is the office in which Ida is appointed to as an inspector for. So, what qualifications do you think Ida had to take on her job as a juvenile investigator for this department? I have no idea. <laughs> um, I was not able to find anything that explained like who was being appointed to various positions, um, how it was determined. Um, there is uh, the, the Board of Supervisors as well as a Civil Service Commission in Los Angeles at this time. So the, the DA is making their recommendations and they're making the final decisions. But what qualified her for this, I don't know. But she's not the only woman in the office either. There are other women working in these other departments as well. But it is also during this time, so these departments get recommended in February. By May of 1915, Ida's working there. And the reason I know this is because of another prosecution that Woolwine is following up on. This is um, the case of Charles Sebastian, who is at this time police chief, but he's also running for mayor. And the district attorney's office had brought suit against him um, in regards to a complaint of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. 
So I believe that's why Ida is brought into this case as an investigator for the juvenile department. The minor in question was about 15, 16 years old. Her name was Edith Serkin. And it just happened to be that Edith was the sister of Sebastian's supposed mistress, <laughs> Lydia, Lillian Pratt, which again might need to be another female justice. <laughs> um, so the district attorney's office had to submit publicly what they spent on prosecuting this case, especially because Sebastian at that time was found not guilty. So the district attorney's office spent about $5,000, which in 1915, good sum of money. Oh, and he won the mayoral race and became mayor. He later like resigns about a year later, but it's okay. He goes on to live with Lillian. It's a whole thing. It's a very interesting story. <laughs> But here you can see in this um, kind of accounting, oops, let me go back here. Do, 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 do. Here's Ida. She worked on the case for 14 days at a rate of $49 and her expenses were 52 cents. But she, she started in February. She only had a couple of months potentially to kind of get acclimated to this new job, do some of her due diligence in, in finding evidence to help prosecute this case. So how good was Ida at her job? This was kind of the next question that all of this led for me. Um, so I started looking around uh, to see if I could find other accounts of Ida as a juvenile in investigator. And I came across three pretty interesting stories, pretty telling stories. The first one is from a newspaper in 1916, uh, the LA Herald, in which it tells the story of a young girl, 13 years old, by the name of Mildred Douglas. Now, neighbors had been complaining about young Mildred. They refer to her as a child Dubarry. Yeah. They say that she is luring boys to her side for adoration and unchildish love. Yeah. So Ida steps in to see what's going on. And she discovers that Mildred's mother is not often home. Mildred's mother works. So I don't know if Mildred's mother was a single mom, but it, the newspaper seems to allude to that. Then uh, it goes on to say, you know, she, she starts to talk to Mildred to see what's, what's going on in the home. And she discovers young Mildred has a six-year-old brother who has tuberculosis of the hip. He can't go out and play. He can't even really go to school most days. So she had been bringing friends home, other boys for him to play with, to read to him. They bring a dog. It's all very heartwarming and sweet. And she tells young Mildred, you know, I'm going to set the neighbors straight. So I, I was really kind of surprised by this story. You know, definitely not how you think things are going to go down. And also, it's one in which she is doing her due diligence. She isn't automatically assuming the worst. She's going to go and talk to people. She wants to find out what's really going on. Now, the next article that you see here is the one that's highlighted, who is to blame? This one was from 1921. So the 20s, you know, we start to think of is this this kind of crazy tumultuous period. Women are getting rights and teenagers are going out to petting parties and rumble buggies and all this stuff. And oh my gosh, the sky is falling. And so this article poses the question, when a girl is lost in LA, is parent responsible? Leading women of the city answer the question. And so they talk to lots of different people, the president of the Parent Teacher Association, a probation officer, the city mother, all of these different people to get their viewpoints. The article is basically asking, you know, 
how come the police aren't following up on reports when pedestrians are saying they're hearing women screaming in cars, they must be getting kidnapped. And Ida again has this kind of very realistic viewpoint on what is happening in the world. She says, by the fact that these cases are very seldom followed up, it is evident that there are few abductions. I believe it is usually a girl out for a good time. The probation officer feels very differently about this. She's talking about how the cars are going to be the ruination of women. You know, so we have these contrasting viewpoints. And again, I feel like Ida is kind of realistic about the world as it is at this time. And she's an older woman. Um, by this time, she's in her 40s. You know, she's about the same age as Woolwine. Um, so she, but she seems to have kind of a realistic view. Now, the last image that I want to share with you is, oops, giving away all my secrets ahead of time, <laughs> is this one here. This is a great political cartoon. Um, made. Uh, this one was published in the LA Express in May of 1921, one year before Ida is dismissed. And it shows all the different people working in the district attorney's office. So most of the people shown are other deputy district attorneys. And then front and center, oops, front and center here, there we go, is Woolwine. I want to draw your particular attention to how they depict Woolwine in this image. So he's standing, he's decisive, he's, he's hollering out, I object. And you've got these ladies drawn behind him. And they're saying things like, oh, Attorney Woolwine is such a wonderful orator. Oh, and he's so handsome. He could be in the movies. Oh, I wish he would look this way for a change. Yes, instead of that stupid jury. So all of these women are just so Twitterpated over Woolwine. And then to the right here, or left, depending on how you're looking at it, um, is Ida. Now, again, she's not the only woman working in this office. But she is the only non-deputy district attorney depicted in this image. And it, underneath it just says, Miss Ida Wright Jones conducting the juvenile delinquency department. Now, the article that follows with this per particular cartoon also mentions Ida. They say um, that they had spent, oops, uh, a delightful half hour with Miss Ida Wright Jones, who so ably conducts the clearinghouse for the morals of the community, the juvenile delinquency department. So by all intents and purposes, everything that I could find, she did a good job. She did a really good job. She worked for the department for seven years. She was a leading upstanding woman of the community. So what happened? Why fire her? Well, it seems that there was a rumor floating around the office that was questioning the relationship between Ida and Woolwine and especially what Ida was planning on doing about said relationship. On May 2nd, 1922, Ida gets a letter from Woolwine that says, you are hereby dismissed from your position you now hold in the district attorney's office, that of juvenile investigator for the good of the service. It is my usual custom to allow employees who have forfeited their right to hold a position in the district attorney's office to resign, but, after a consideration of all the circumstances, I do not deem that you are entitled to this courtesy. Yours very truly, Thomas Lee Woolwine. What do you guys think of that? Oof. <laughs> Getting some oofs in here.
Very, very good. Okay, so one of the comments in the room was that this is a very personal attack. This is, there's no statements to cor to corroborate or to explain what is the reasons, the grounds of her dismissal. Yes. Interesting, interesting. So another comment that was just made was that it seems to be a very swift statement. Like he just wants to get it out there. Just, just make this statement because perhaps he knows that there is a rebuttal coming, which legally he was required to provide her. And this is gonna become a sticking point in regards to her dismissal. Yes, Jennifer. Uh, <laughs> No comment online. Very, yes, very rude indeed, Joyce. <laughs> true, true. I don't know. I guess letters are the text of the day, so it's better than being fired in a text. That's a, that's a very funny comment. Um, yeah. Uh, no, it was a formal letter written on department head, the district attorney letterhead, uh, the copy of which you see was printed in the paper. Um, and what he then does is about 11 days later, he sends another letter to the County Civil Service Commission. And here we get the explanation for why she was dismissed. Here it says, this advises you gentlemen that I have discharged Ida Wright Jones um, from, uh, as an employee of the district attorney's office. Her dismissal was embodied in the letter of date May 2nd, which is the one there, uh, a copy of which I herewith enclose. In accordance with the provisions of subdivision, nice legal jargon there, subdivision 13 of the section 34 of the charter, I give my reasons for such action as follows. It was communicated to me by one of the employees of the district attorney's office that Miss Jones had stated to him that she was going to make an affidavit to the effect that she was that she had been intimate with me and that she was going to sell this affidavit to my political enemies for the sum of $10,000 and then leave the state. Upon verifying the fact that she had made a statement and that she had planned to take such action, I immediately discharged her. Very respectfully, Thomas Lee Woolwine. So both of these letters are printed in the Los Angeles Times, as well as other local papers the following day on May 14th. Now, I think it was the assumption that Ida would just go away. You know, he's, he has stated this, this pretty damning statement that basically she's trying to blackmail me. So I kicked her out of her position. I mean, very good question. The question was, where did he hear the rumor? I was not able to find any statements of who told him. Exactly. Um, there was there was no one. Um, he says some a, a male in his office, a man in his office had told him about this. Also that, you know, she was planning on selling this to his political enemies. Who? What political enemy? What person are you talking about? Yes. I've also heard William Doran, um, who was a deputy district attorney who also later goes on to be a judge within Los Angeles. Um, so the, the, the statement was um, that it was, what was the gentleman? Uh, Jesse Hunter, who supposedly, who was a, another district, a deputy district attorney in the district attorney's office, who might have said this. He also later on uh, produces an affidavit supposedly by someone else. Um, so a lot of these names are kind of being bandied about, but there is no factual evidence for, and he never says it. He kind of leaves things in broad terms as far as I was able to find. <clears throat> so Ida didn't take her dismissal quietly. 
Instead, she goes and hires Paul Schneck, the guy he punched in the face the year before. <laughs> she, she hires him and his partner Kitterell to um, act as her attorneys. Um, they also submit her reply to the county service, the civil service commission. And she denies that she had any intention of selling any such affidavit, that she only made an affidavit about their relationship after she was dismissed. Um, which is all of this is uh, covered by the LA Times about a week later on May 27th. So I'm gonna share with you some of what was written there. Come on. Sorry, the computer's acting a little slow. So since her discharge as investigator of juvenile cases for Mr. Woolwine, Ms. Jones has denied emphatically of making any overtures towards obtaining any money for her asserted information that she and Mr. Woolwine had been intimate. Although denying this phase of charges of the district attorney, she asserted repeatedly that for five years they were intimate and that an operation deemed necessary because of these declared relations was performed in Los Angeles in January of 1921. So she's saying, we slept together and I had to have an abortion. She then goes on to say another illness of a similar origin was experienced by her in 1917 at Elizabeth Lake. Uh, so these are all according to her statements. Um, details of these instances, as well as other information connected with the case were included in her statement for the commission it was learned. Mr. Woolwine has declined to make any statement on the case other than written explanation given on the commission for her discharge. He was not at home last night and could not be reached for a statement. So why do you think she did this? Why divulge these inform this information? This is a highly illegal event. <laughs> you know, it is, is not legal for her to be seeking these, these kinds of surgeries. Um, it's definitely not legal for the district attorney to know about this. So why, why do this? <laughs> well, she, I am absolutely divulging this horrible thing that happened to me because I want to show you I am the that, That's a very good comment, very interesting comment. And if anybody wants to dispute that, so <laughs> what was being said in, in the room, because this is where we get to have great conversations. Um, so the comment in the room was that basically she laid it all out there to show just how trustworthy she is. If we're gonna talk about this, then let's just lay it all out there. Yes. And then he had a comment from her that um, she was gonna lose her job and so will he. So yeah, so also another possibility is that, you know, if I'm going down, I'm taking him with me. You know, if I'm gonna lose my job, well, he should be held accountable too. Another possibility, which I found quite interesting, is actually in the last paragraph of the statement. Miss Jones retained Schneck and Kitterell on the night she was discharged and after she had been told, according to her statement, that Woolwine planned to break her and railroad her to the psychopathic ward. Now, some of you might be thinking, that can't happen. Women aren't forced into institutions to keep them quiet. I see the women in the room are like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to take a little kind of 
bird walk, a little, a little side path here on kind of the history of women being silenced. We often throw around terms like crazy, hysterical. Um, these, these terms have been utilized throughout history to kind of diminish something that a woman is doing or thinking or saying. Um, and at various times throughout history, women have been literally declared insane by the men in their lives to prevent them from acting out in certain ways or in ways that maybe society as a whole didn't agree with. So I wanted to give you a couple of prominent examples of this. Um, in 1860, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Packard, here's her picture, is placed into a mental institution by her husband. Now, by 1860, in the 19th century, psychiatry is on the rise. So people are looking at this newfound tool, things to unlock the human brain and understand why we're doing the things we're doing. But at various times, it was often used against women to try and keep them quiet. In Elizabeth's situation, she was placed in a mental institution by her husband after many, many years of marriage because she publicly questioned her husband's religious beliefs. He was a Calvinist minister at the time. And not only was she expressing opinions contrary to his, but uh, they also disagreed on child rearing. They had six kids, family finances, how he was spending the family money, um, issues of slavery. They were in Illinois. She was a supporter of John Brown. This embarrassed her husband to no end. And also she wanted to teach. She, she saw value in educating children. And he thought, oh, well, she must be crazy. So he brings in an alienist, what psychiatrists are called at the time, to pose as a sewing machine repair salesman to talk with her for 20, 30 minutes. After which she goes, he goes to her husband and says, yeah, she doesn't like you very much. I think she must be insane. She's placed in an institution for three years. And while there, she sees that she's not the only one experiencing this. And the only reason she is let out is because of her children. Her children fight to have her released. But the institution has declared her insane and they return her to her husband who then promptly locks her in a room and nails the window shut. She eventually is able to get a message to a neighbor about her treatment and they force a sanity hearing for her, which was not done prior to her being put into the mental institution. And within seven minutes after the jury meet to discuss her case, they declare her sane. And she quickly divorces her husband. <laughs> And she ends up kind of forming the anti assane Asylum Society because she sees that she is not the first woman or the only woman to experience this. But you guys might be thinking, it was the 1860s. Women didn't have much rights then. You know, um, perhaps this was kind of a fluke. Besides, you know, husbands, you know, family members, they often kind of overstep. So here's another example, Alice Paul, famous women's rights advocate. Um, in 1917, she, as leader of the National Women's Party, gather women together to protest at the White House. These women become known as the silent sentinels. They stand quietly holding signs. They do not impede sidewalk traffic. They do not engage in people throwing things at them, screaming and yelling in their faces. They stand quietly with signs, asking President Woodrow Wilson things like, how long must women wait for liberty? They soon start getting arrested. Alice is arrested in October of 1917. 
and sentenced to seven months in prison. While there, she begins a hunger strike. And I found this telegram uh, written to Jane Adams, kind of explaining the situation in which Alice finds herself in. Alice Paul and Rose Winlow, Winslow being forcibly fed. They had tubes put down their throat, were forced to drink milk and raw eggs. Alice Paul detained in psyche, psychopathic ward under observation by alienists and threatened with incarceration in St. Elizabeth's Assane Asylum. She's obviously crazy. She's willing to die for a cause. How insane is that? Well, we ask military people to do that every day. We ask first responders, we ask all these people willing to, to, be, to believe in something enough to be willing to give their lives for it. So that's what she was doing, but she must be insane. Now, again, you might be thinking, but Jenny, it's 1917, World War I. There's a lot of chaos going on. Things are changing. It's too much. So I give you the story of Christine Collins, 1928, Los Angeles. Christine is a single working mom. Her husband happens to be incarcerated at this time. Her nine-year-old son, Walter, goes missing. This makes national headlines because other boys are also going missing in Los Angeles. And five months after Walter disappears, there's a story circulate, circulating that there is a boy in Illinois who is Walter. So the police bring Walter home. Christine is overjoyed at this news. She goes to meet her son and sees him and says, oh, this isn't my boy. The police chief at the time, whose name I want to make sure I get right, Jones was his last name, J.J. Jones, Captain J.J. Jones, and the LAPD are facing such public pressure at this time to find these missing boys that he actually tells her, why don't you just take him home and try him out? She doesn't know what to do. She's, she's a telephone operator. This is the chief of police. So she does. Three weeks later, she comes back armed with dental records and statements made by friends and family members saying this is not her son. So what do you think Jones does? He puts her in the psychiatric ward of the Los Angeles County Hospital. She remains there and is only released after that boy admits, I'm not Walter. My name's Arthur. I wanted a free ride to California to meet Tom Nix, the cowboy star. She sued the department, was awarded $10,000, but was never paid. Now you guys might be thinking, well, Jenny, this is a long time ago, right? These things don't happen anymore. We don't, we don't try to silence women by calling them crazy, hysterical, try to put them into institutions against their will, right? I digress, back to Ida. So Ida's fighting for her job. And since uh, Woolmine never gave her the chance to respond, she responds to this County Civil Service Commission and she makes some pretty astonishing statements, which I wanna share in her own words. Well, just hit me, Woolmine would have done a lot better if we had just accused her of being a witch. <laughs> then she could have been burned and all would be over with. The statement was maybe Woolwine should have just accused her of being a witch. Yeah. Um, maybe he would have done better that way. People would have questioned things less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Un unfortunately, we don't because we don't know how many women genuinely needed mental health assistance and how many were being placed there because of the powers that be, because of the people in their lives who just wanted to put them away. Because the reasons for some of the um, reasons that women are put away are things like melancholia, enjoying sex, um, you know. Yes, that's a great one, wandering of the uterus. Another little side note, I know Michelle might enjoy this. The root word for hysterical is a Greek word for uterus. So hysteria, all of those, those inflictions, they thought women were already naturally prone to these kinds of attitudes and outrages. And so it's very difficult to try to figure out who needed to be there and who was forced against their will to be there. Yeah. Prior to the Lancerman Petra Short Act, which today says you can be put away for a danger to self danger to others, a great disabled, all it took was a testimony of two doctors mm -hmm. to say you were insane. So that's all, and, they, and you lost all your civil rights, two doctors, it was in the lunacy court, they appeared before a judge, and uh, they present evidence, they're insane because they cry a lot, because they're forgetful, because she doesn't recognize her own child that I say is her child, and uh, the judge rules, and you're gone. Yes, so yes, we definitely had lunacy courts up until I think the 1980s? Uh, 1970s. 1970s, 80s. Okay. Um, so yeah, up, so recent history, our recent history, all you needed was two doctors to say, if, yeah. If, if grandma was rich and you were going to inherit her money, you accuse her of having the disease nostalgia, yes. which is talking about the old days. Yes. So the, the statement that was being made was if grandma's got money, you, you want to inherit a little faster. It was much easier to put grandma away under the, the kind of baseless accusation of nostalgia um, versus grandpa. Um, people were much more likely to believe women were easily falling prey to a variety of things that men were just too strong to fall prey to. All right, back to Ida. Um, so she says in her letter, in reply to Woolwine's reason for discharging me from the county services and recently filed on record in your office, I wish to make a reply as follows. I deny absolutely that I ever said to anyone that I will sell or even offer for sale any story or affidavit regarding myself or Thomas Lee Woolwine. I deny that I ever considered or thought of doing such an act. I am not charged with incompetency or neglect of duty or any act that would constitute grounds for my dismissal from the county service. The county rendered by me, or the services rendered by me to this county of Los Angeles has always been of value, such that would entitle me to hold my position at the salary I received. The truth, this goes to Michelle's point, and I am not going to shirk the truth, nor am I going to be afraid of the truth, shall be told regarding the conditions under which I was compelled to work by Thomas Lee Woolwine. While an employee of the County of Los Angeles, I shall ask no sympathy as I shall make no excuses. Let all concerned in the matter have the same courage. Let Woolwine for once in his life, step out in the bright light as he really is. Let's tell the public all about it, the whole miserable business and tell the true reason why he discharged me, which in fact is, that when my poor miserable body became too ill for Woolwine to use it any longer, then and not until then did Woolwine conceive the idea of kicking me out of county service. Whoa. She is pulling no punches. Whoa. Now, as also a little side note, the papers make a big deal of the fact that she is a woman in her 40s. They don't make the, any, any, they don't even state Woolwine's age. But they, there's comments made like, she is sliding quietly into her mid forties during the time that she is working for Woolwine. As a woman in her forties, I take umbrage with this. <laughs> 
But she also goes on to make some other really um, radical statements. Um, she states that Woolwine had already secretly engineered the placing of me aside from my position of high power and influence with the connection with the administration of the office. And no longer was I allowed a voice in Woolwine's policy. So he says, she says that he was already kind of pushing her towards the door before this kind of ridiculous statement is made. Um, she says that I was thrown to the wolves of Woolwine's power. Woolwine was in possession of the dreadful truce all the time. Um, she also speaks to how he thought she would just go away. And this is one of the reasons that really kind of attracted me to this story because we don't hear this, these stories enough in history. She says, Woolwine, knowing my pride and of the good blood coursing in my veins, relied on the fact that with my heart broken, my health gone, and that my spirit would break and that I would fade from the picture. Woolwine nearly succeeded, but my spirit would not break. I became enraged. I went to Woolwine. She then tells him, like, look, I'm, I'm going to tell everybody what really happened. And she says, Woolwine laughed in my face and said to me, you have not one friend in this office. Go and tell. I will ruin you anyway. <clears throat> she then goes on to describe their relationship. I am a little hesitant to use the term intimate relationship. That's how it's phrased in the papers. Um, because in some ways it seems very one-sided as she states, you know, how I was compelled to work for Woolwine. Later, she says about their first time spent together that Woolwine knows that on August 25th, 1917 at about 1 p.m. acting under his instruction. I went to the Angeles Hotel at San Pedro, and there I registered as Mr. and Mrs. J.D. Edwards of San Diego, California. She then says, well, one comes to the hotel, um, sees somebody he knows, kind of panics a little bit, registers himself, but then goes um, to her room Came, came to her room and she says, Woolwine knows that he came to my room for an unlawful purpose. So not only should my morality be questioned in this, but what about his? Also, secondly, for me, and this is just my opinion, she doesn't have the language of sexual harassment yet. Sexual harassment, that, that term is not uttered until the 1970s. Um, so how do you provide words to things of your situation? I mean, is, did he, at this time, there's laws against rape. There's laws against groping. There aren't laws protecting women in the workplace, especially because at these times, there are pamphlets published for women on how to deal with the men in the office. So her using words like compelled under his instruction makes me wonder, is this a loving relationship? Did, did they have a relationship or was this the means of her employment? That I do not know. Uh, she also goes into some detail published in the papers about um, how much he knew about the operations that were performed on her, that he had sent a woman and a man to drive her to a doctor's office, that they then later took her to a deputy DA's home to recuperate for two weeks, and that the earlier operation in 1917 in Lake Elizabeth, he actually brought his wife up to check on her and see how she was doing. Um, so she actually says at the end, I respectfully submit to the Honorable Commission that Woolwine did not state the real or proper reason for dismissing me from county service. I hereby ask that the commission give me a public hearing and take into evidence the above information and determine wherein the truth is. She talks about truth repeatedly in all of this. Yes, Jennifer.
the, the power dynamic. That's a very good statement, Alan, that, you know, it is quite possible that he took advantage of, of her situation because he is a person in a position of power. Yes. You, you can, yeah, you can sue uh, um, on behalf of alienation of affections in some places, so. Oh, the, the, the statement was um, you are being, a, you are able to, uh, uh, adultery is a crime and that you have legal grounds in, in some parts of the United States still to uh, prosecute for alienation of affection. You can, you can sue your, your spouse's mistress or person that they're engaging in acts with. <laughs> So yes, exactly. So what does what does the Civil Service Commission do? <laughs> they kind of freak out a little bit. They're like, whoa, this is a lot more information <laughs> than we were expecting to get about this. So they decide, okay, well, we can't make this determination. We thought it was just the, the dismissal of a county employee. So we're gonna pass the buck. This is from the Riverside Press Enterprise in 1922, so I, I love that, you know, Civil Service Commission passes buck to inquisitorial body. Uh, district attorney continues to, to rage basically against his enemies. Um, so they don't know what to do. So they're gonna have the grand jury try to determine whether or not there are grounds for a further inquiry and the possibility of charges being dropped or, or being given against Woolwine and possibly Jones. Yes. Oh. That's a that's an excellent question. Uh, Where did she get the money? Um, it seems that possibly Shrek and Kitterall uh, took her her case for free, potentially. Maybe you know Paul didn't like getting punched in the face and thought, yeah, I'll help you out. <laughs> um the other lawsuits she you know she was an independent working woman i'm imagining her salary was very good that's why she's fighting for it um in the district attorney's office uh so maybe she saved a little there was i haven't been able to find any information saying like where the funds came from she also has an interesting friendship later on that i'll mention that could maybe be a possibility for where she got the money so what do you think Woolwine is doing during all this? We haven't talked about him for a little bit. What do, what do you think Woolwine's up to? I think he is actively as an example. He denies the strength and the unmitigated gall of the So the statement was, yeah, very, yeah that's a, I'm, I'm sure he was a little like, oh, oh, geez, oh, geez. So the, the comment was, you know, he was kind of relying on, you know, his, his charm, his prestige within the community, that this would eventually just go away. And he was probably very, very shocked by the, the, the vehemence um, that she was kind of unleashing by telling these, these very dramatic stories or statements, I should say. So this I'm going to show you is exactly what Woolwine was up to. He runs for governor of California. <laughs> One week after she submits her response to the Civil Service Commission, he states he is going to try and buy for the Democratic ticket to uh, run for governor of California. <laughs> and he releases a statement. Now, this one in particular, I, I enjoyed because he says every public official is ultimately attacked by some woman. Uh, these charges are vicious and mendacious. Naturally, I would not engage in a controversy with a person of that type. Now, what's interesting, I think, is the article goes on to state two more days passed and then the Civil Service Commission voted to refer the charges to the grand jury. I love how this section is written. 
newspapers at this time, a bit more colorful than they are today. Woolwine flared with all the eloquence and vigor of his practiced tongue is capable when he excoriated the action as an attempt by two individuals for who, who for years have used every foul means and their mendacity could conceive to blacken my name and who now have resorted to this age old political trick. These men, said Woolwine, have induced this woman to file with the commission an unbelievably vicious and unfounded attack upon me. One thing that I, I just realized I neglected to state that also Ida Wright Jones had filed or had said in her letter to the commission was this. The world knows that Woolwine has not publicly denied his relations with me but only publicly accuses me of, and untruthfully so, offering to sell a story to ruin him. He's a good lawyer. He knows what should, could maybe lead people a certain idea, a certain viewpoint. He never, that I could find again, out and out calls her a liar. That is kind of surprising to me for a man that's willing to punch people in the face in the courtroom for making disparaging remarks upon his character. Maybe it's a Southern gentleman thing. Maybe he thinks, you know, I'm not gonna go after a woman. That's possible. But the fact that this newspaper is showing like how outraged he becomes at pointing the finger at these other political enemies who are trying to ruin him is an interesting way to, to tell the story, to spin the story. So what then happens? <clears throat> um, so he, he's in the process of running for governor. He eventually does not win the Democratic nomination. He probably would have been governor of New York very easily. <laughs> Jim just said he'd probably be governor of New York pretty easily. Way to bring it to modern day, Jim. <laughs> um, there are interestingly some hiccups in the grand jury's investigation of the case. Um, the evidence that Ida had originally brought to the Civil Service Commission to pass along to the ground jury, go missing. Um, there is also uh, an organization in Los Angeles at the time known as the Citizens Anti-Crime Committee who are upset about this news and reach out to US, um, uh, the, the US Attorney General, uh, Ulysses Webb, to say, you need to get involved in this. And they send that letter to the Civil Service Commission, which passes it on to the grand jury, but that letter also goes missing. They are eventually found several weeks later. The um, grand jury room's mailbox apparently wasn't checked, even though everybody was looking for this information. But lo and behold, they unlocked the mailbox and, and there it all is. Not trying to play conspiracy theory, but it makes you kind of go, what? Um, then there's other further postponements. So the grand jury doesn't finally open the matter until July 12th. So this, she's fired May 2nd. This just lingers and languishes, lingers and languishes until July 12th. Finally, they begin to meet about this, but all their meetings are held behind closed doors. The only references that I could find about what happened in the grand jury room was that Woolwine submitted an affidavit to them uh, by a woman who said that Ida Wright Jones had said to her, I will get a lot of money out of Woolwine. Okay. Um, what's questionable about this is that the original reason for dismissal says that she's gonna sell to political enemies and get $10,000. Not, I'm going to blackmail Woolwine into giving me $10,000. Um, the other 
thing that I could find about discussions in the grand jury room was that in one meeting, there was a lot of yelling heard in the corridors uh, while Woolwine was meeting with the grand jury. Um, finally, on July 18th, a formal decision was made. What do you think they did? What do you think the grand jury decides to do? I see just a lot of head shaking, uncertainty. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? I'll tell you what they did. Nothing. Grand jury will drop inquiry into charges made against District Attorney Woolwine. There is never an official report filed. The only thing that is stated is in this article here from the Times, which says, <clears throat> the charge of Ida White Jones, formerly an investigator in the district attorney's office concerning her asserted relations with district attorney Woolwine will not be given any further attention by the grand jury. This was decided upon late yesterday afternoon after Ms. Jones had given her testimony and after two physicians whose names were not revealed had been heard. No formal report was prepared but the grand jury made a statement for the public and the press, which said, our investigation of the jury Jones Woolwine charges did not disclose sufficient evidence to justify further action. What the grounds are for that, how they decided that they never disclose. Yes. Um, there, there could be women, um, but at this, per, this particular gathering of the grand jury, it is only men. Um, now, the foreman of the grand jury does make a statement. He refuses to comment upon the official statement, um, but other than to say he understood it worked both ways. And then the newspaper makes the assumption that this is meant to be believed to mean that the dismissal not only of Ms. Jones's charges against Mr. Woolwine, but also of Mr. Woolwine's charge that the former employee of his office had offered to sell information against him to his political enemies. That's what she thought. And that's what she continued to sue for. Uh, she continues to, to file suits, civil suits against Woolwine, against the district attorney's office. Um, I, Woolwine ends up stepping down as district attorney in 1923. He, sell, he cites health issues and he was an ill man. Uh, he dies in 1925, kind of unexpectedly. Um, but she continues on. Uh, she continues to file up until uh, 1927 was the last one that I was able to find. So five years after this initially explodes. Um, and she's filing for back pay. She's filing for reinstatement. She's, she eventually also ends up trying to file slander charges against the newspapers. Um, but basically the attorneys or the judge in that case says, well, if you say that what you're admitting to is true that you had abortions, that you had this affair with a married man, then there's nothing slanderous that was written because it's true. So she really had no, no means, no grounds. Um, so all I guess she could do after all these avenues are exhausted is just try to find a way to live her life. And so that's what she did. Um, in this is Ida Wright Jones in the 1930 census. She is interestingly living on uh, Southwestern Avenue in Los Angeles. She apparently remained in Los Angeles for the rest of her life. She is living here. Let me highlight her name. There she is. She's living here with one Lydia Firestone, the widowed the widow of Elmer Firestone, brother to Harvey Firestone, the, the tire magnet. <laughs> How the two met, I have zero idea. Um, maybe Lydia was a little bit of a help with that question that we had earlier about how she was able to finance some of this, perhaps, maybe. Um, she also appears in the voter rolls. Um, up until about 1936, living at this address. So she remained there for quite a bit of time. 
Um, and then in the 1940 census, she apparently has moved. There you go. Um, she is now living at uh, Orange, on Orange Street, um, at the home of a woman by the name of Elizabeth Day. So let me zoom in there. And uh, in the voter register by this time, she is listed as a real estate broker. So she continues to work. She continues to find employment, um, which, you know, good for her. I, I'm glad <laughs> she was able to um, kind of find means of supporting herself. And then the last bit of information that I could find on Ida is her death certificate um, from August 7th, 1958. Um, she's living on Rampart. She died of cancer. Um, she, as far as this certificate says, um, the information that is provided, she never married. Um, so she owned her own home, which was great. Um, she, she kind of found a way, I think, forward, I hope, for her sake, um, to, to find a life for herself. Um, but that does take me to the end of the dismissal of Ida Wright Jones. So if anybody has any final questions, comments, please. Yes, Jennifer. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I, that's, a, that's a great comment, Bob. Um, yeah, because as he is prosecuting the Madeline Obenchain, Arthur Birch cases for murder, he's also battling the Ku Klux Klan in Eaglewood at the same time as he is battling his own uh, trials and tribulations. So he is taking on a lot. It's also very surprising that, again, he decides to run for governor in the midst of all this. Um, Unfortunately, his, his raid on the Klan, um, though very surprising for 1922-1, uh, for a Southerner to want to bring charges against the Klan. Um, he, you know, again, he's a, he's a man who prided himself in many ways, outspokenly, of following the rules of the law. And also, I think sometimes not to negate anything that happened in this case. It's also very unclear, unclear. You know, I this is just what I've been able to pull together in telling this story. Um, I don't know the nature of their relationship. I can't tell you whether or not it was completely consensual or not. Um, we often want people to be perfect in history and people are not in the past, nor are they today. Uh, you hope that people learn from their mistakes, that they can rise above it, that they can, they can still do good things, but they are imperfect people who also can do terrible things to other people. Yes. Mm. Yes, I, I mentioned that earlier that Doran was one of the people who might have possibly also uh, gave the information to Woolwine that she was planning on filing this affidavit. That to me, um, and this again is just my opinion, somebody didn't get you time, Doran doesn't give her time off, so now she's going to blackmail Woolwine? That there's something missing to me in, in that story. Um, that there's one that is printed in the papers at the time. 
but wouldn't you take it out on Doran if he's the acting district attorney at the time? Wouldn't you want to see him go away instead of Woolwine? I think as she had stated early on in her letter, she already felt like she was being pushed out of her position. She was already kind of being pushed aside. So I, I, I don't know if, and also it's questionable about why she needed the time off because if these operations did were performed and Woolwine wasn't around, was that another reason why he denied time off? Because they don't go into the reason why she is denied time off. Um, any other questions, comments, thoughts? I would, again, this was like what the, the comment was that Nicoletta, uh, Nicoletta? Nicoletta made was that, um, you know, she requested Woolwine fire Doran, um, but he wouldn't. That I have only been able to find in one paper, so I don't have any kind of corroborating with that. Um, also, okay, if that's the, the, what's really missing in this case is we don't know what the evidence is. We, we don't know what the grand jury reviewed. We don't know the particulars of everything that was brought to them in determining this case. Um, and in the end, they both basically said, well, we see it both ways. So there's, there must have been something there, but they just determined not to deal with it. And it was easier to just get rid of her than to really go up against Woolwine. So her dismissal stood. <laughs> the comment was, well, at least she wasn't, you know, taken care of and, and knocked her off in, in other ways. Yes. That's a good question. No, um, as far as I know, she dies in an institution. Yeah, um, the question was what happened to Ida's mother? Um, I, I don't know. And the reasons why she was institutionalized, I was not able to find. The last thing that I wanna kind of leave you guys with if there aren't any other further comments or questions um, is one of the reasons I, wanted to share this story um, because we think of these things as only happening now or in the recent past. The fact is, is that the, the power levels and issues of who can do what to whom at what time is a constant in history. And I was very happy to bring back at least, or at least highlight her story, because otherwise this is a forgotten story. This is a forgotten person in our history who decided to challenge the powers that be. Um, I think it's very easy for us to also, as historians, we often say, well, if we don't have the evidence, we can't really say, so we don't say anything. So that's why I just wanted to kind of put things out to you guys today to make up your own minds and also be thoughtful of that as we continue to kind of see these stories today, because it becomes very easy to write things off because someone is crazy, because someone is hysterical, because someone isn't the perfect victim, because someone isn't the perfect politician. And so it's just something to kind of think about as we're confronted by the vastness of what happens in our world today and as these, these stories kind of continue. So I thank you guys very, very much for joining online, for coming in today, for listening, and hopefully we'll see you guys again. Thanks, guys. Hey.
I will try my best to sum up that, that very nice <laughs> and eloquent statement um, about um, even though it's a difficult history to address and one that also isn't written about very much. We don't, we don't, again, we didn't have the word sexual harassment until 1970s. We don't really see the first prosecutions of sexual harassment until Anita Hill in the 1980s when Clarence, uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is being um, up when he was up for nomination, um, that this starts to become more realized as an issue that people are facing. Um, and we will, as Michelle was saying, we will continue to kind of see these issues come up, but it's good to kind of also remember where we came from in, in that, and that this unfortunately is a very long history of power dynamics of people trying to find you know, how to negotiate with each other and hopefully eventually seeing people as people instead of things to control or, you know, avenues to getting to certain places in society. Oh, last slide. Yes. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> we have more things happening at the museum. So thank you guys again for joining me today. If you want to continue the discussion, please email me. I love talking about this stuff. Um, g.trulock at homesteadmuseum.org. Also check out the museum's website. We always have um, interesting programs and things going on. We are back in person, so you can come and visit the houses again and hear more of the histories of the Workman and Temple families, as well as other things kind of going on in society at different times. Uh, we are open for public tours Friday through Sunday at 12, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, we are closed now the fourth weekend of every month. Um, so we do not have tours the fourth Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the month. We do have other interesting upcoming programs. Robert Barron, our facilities coordinator, and also sommelier, is going to be talking about the history of fortified wine, a very mixed history, which I thought was a great little pun there. Um, also, book club is still meeting on October 1st. They are going to be reading the nonfiction book club. We'll be discussing the Mirage Factory Illusion Imagination and the Invention of Los Angeles by Gary Christ. And on October 20th, the Fiction Book Club will be talking about Erewhon. May want to make sure I'm pronouncing that right, Erewhon uh, by Samuel Butler. So if those books are appealing to you, please sign up. If you like having discussions about interesting topics and facts, please sign up. You can either join us in person or online. Thank you guys again for coming and for watching and Okay, and we're good. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the question was, did Will Wine stay married? Alma stood by him. And she actually um, really was instrumental in kind of running his re-election campaigns. Wow. Yeah, so she, you know, she stayed with him his entire life. And she, she did remarry later on in life after his death. All right. Thank you guys very much.